A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf is an essay published in the year 1929. Now, in the previous year, that is in 1928, Virginia Woolf was called to two women's colleges, one named Newman College and the other Girton College. So, she was asked to deliver lectures based on the topic women and fiction. So, she gave two lectures and these lectures later was transformed into an essay form and it was titled A Room of One's Own. The title of the essay comes from one of the quotes. That is, according to Wolf, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. This is a quote that Virginia Woolf uses in the first chapter of the essay. As you can see, Woolf stresses on the idea that if you expect a woman to write fiction, then she should have two things. And what are they? She should have money and she should have privacy, a room for herself. And this point is discussed throughout the essay. Now, before moving into the essay, we will also talk about the narrator. The narrator of A Room of One's Own is not Virginia Woolf. It's an unnamed female narrator. We do not know who the narrator is. The narrator keeps on describing various experiences she had, but we do not know who she is. We only know that she is a female narrator. Now, Wolf uses this unnamed narrator because Wolf wants to emphasize that this person, this female character could be any one of us. It doesn't have to be only Wolf. It doesn't have to be only one particular character. It could be any woman. So to give that universality, Wolf is using an unnamed narrator, female narrator. And we also find that she uses a narrative technique throughout this essay. That is, she talks to us as if she is telling us a story. Now, in the story, you find a lot of experiences. Some of them might be true and some of them might not be true. So, it's like a storytelling. There is fact and fiction mixed in the essay. We will move on to the essay. There are six chapters in this essay. Think of it as a story about a woman who is aspiring to become a writer. So the essay begins with a woman who is sitting near the river bank. We do not know who this is. This is our narrator. She is sitting by the river bank and suddenly she gets an idea in her mind. So she is so excited about the idea that she runs. She doesn't want to wait and lose this idea. So she runs in a hurry so that she can jot it down somewhere. And she goes to this Oxbridge College. Oxbridge could be a term connecting Oxford and Cambridge. So when she is running, she is running through the grass, through the lawn. And the security guard there in the Oxbridge College comes and scolds her, kind of tells her to move off the grass, to keep off the grass because the grass is only meant for male students and scholars. So here she faces the first discrimination. Now she is struggling to keep her idea in her mind. She has something very bright, a bright idea in her mind, but she is facing a lot of difficulties. So she decides, okay, she will go to the library now. And when she reaches the library, she is told that a woman can enter the library only with a fellow, a male student, or with a letter of introduction. So again, she is denied entry into the library because she is a female. Now, obviously, she is upset. Now, as she is walking, she hears some instruments and songs from a chapel and she first she thinks about whether she should enter the chapel to see what is happening inside or not. But then she decides that even if she tries, there will be somebody who will ask her to not enter. So she decides to move on without entering the chapel. So here we can see how Wolf shows us that women are shut out from social and political institutions. We are not seeing women being included. Instead, they are being excluded. So our narrator, even though she is angry, we see that by the end, she is also slowly accepting that maybe she will be rejected. She won't be allowed permission to get in by the time she reaches the chapel. She has accepted that. Now, our narrator, she continues walking on and she goes to a lunch party. And this is a lunch party for the students of Oxbridge College. Now she sees that in this lunch party there is plenty of food, plenty of wine and there is bright conversations all around. People are talking about exciting topics. 
so she enjoys the party she is very excited uh, there is this instance where she sees a cat without a tail so here our imaginary narrator says that just like how this cat doesn't have a tail there is something that is missing in this lunch party also even though everybody is uh, very excited uh, she remembers that in the previous lunch parties that she has attended people used to hum songs like tennyson's poems they used to do this humming noise along with the poems it used to be fun but even though there is plenty of food and plenty of wine bright conversations uh, that artistic element is missing in this lunch party here she is referring to the post war poems and the fiction that was written she believes that after the war um, art has lost its artness a part of humanness has been lost so she is just mentioning that uh, in between her essay with the metaphor of a cat without a tail so the lunch party is over now she moves on it's time for dinner she reaches the women's college in ferham now when she reaches there she gets her dinner and she notices that the meal is very simple and the conversations that they have it was not at all interesting it simply was full of gossips now she is showing us a contrast between the men's institution which she went to during the lunch and the women's institution during dinner so there it was all great food excellent food excellent conversations here it was just plain simple food gossips instead of having interesting conversations so our imaginary narrator felt bad about it and she goes and talks to the daughter of the college founder and the daughter tells her see the men's college will have a lot of funds coming from different places now this college the women's college is run by the girl's mother and she talks about how difficult it is to raise funds for this institution so again here wolf is showing the differences how the men's colleges are given a lot of funds whereas a women's college is not given even the required amount for the college to prosper and thus we get the idea of what type of educational experiences are given to men and what type of experiences are given to women now we were talking about the educated people the elite class now the narrator our imaginary narrator wants to know why is there a difference between what is given to men and what is given to women so in order to find the answers to find some truths next day she goes to the british museum in london and once she reaches there she goes through the books and she finds that there are a lot of books about women but they are not written by women they are written by men and it kind of shows women in an inferior way she was not very satisfied she moves out now she is sitting and reading a newspaper and while she is reading again she finds that all the major headlines of the newspaper are about men the major roles played by men uh, how superior men are and these headlines are all displaying women as someone inferior again now she is sitting and thinking about both these incidents in the british museum and in the newspaper now we are talking about common people now this is not about educated class a museum where people could go newspaper which is available to everyone so she feels that women have been used as a mirror to enlarge men that is by showing that women are inferior men are trying to show that they are superior and while she is sitting and thinking about this the waiter comes and tells her to pay the bill now when he comes and tells her this she remembers that her aunt has given her a stipend where she will be given 500 pounds every year as allowance now she remembers that she got this allowance the same day when women got the right to vote we know that women getting the right to vote is a very big historical moment we talk about it a lot now according to our imaginary narrator she is more happy that she got money than she got the right to vote because after getting the right to vote she did not get much freedom but after getting this allowance this money financial independence she is free she is free to control her own life so she feels that this money gives her more freedom than her right to vote 
So two points that our imaginary narrator is discussing here is how the society constantly tries to impart the sense of female inferiority. Also, she talks about the importance of financial independence, the kind of freedom that it brings. Now, we are in chapter 3. Our narrator's story continues. She is thinking about the Elizabethan period. We know Elizabethan period is told as the golden era of English literature, a period when plenty of numerous excellent works were written. So our imaginary narrator, she decides that she is going to find about the history of women, how women started writing and all this stuff from these history books of the Elizabethan period. And she couldn't find any about real women. Nobody has written anything about real women from the period. And if at all anything has been written by men, it is about women as property of their husbands. And this is where she talks about Shakespeare's imaginary sister whom she names Judith Shakespeare. Now she gives us this example of Judith Shakespeare because she wants us to show that during the Elizabethan period it was not that women did not have talents. It was that women with talents were not given opportunities like Judith Shakespeare. Now imagine Shakespeare had a sister named Judith. She was as talented as Shakespeare. She could have written uh, excellent plays just like Shakespeare. But what would be the difference in her life and Shakespeare's life? Now Judith being a girl wouldn't have gotten the education that Shakespeare got. She might have been uneducated. And when she told her parents that she wants to pursue theatre, she wants to write plays, her parents and as well as the society might have told her that this is not meant for women. We know during Shakespeare's times, women did not act, women did not write. Even the roles of women by were played by young boys. So the, she had rejection from her family and society. So she had ran away from home, she reached a theatre. And even they told her the same, that she couldn't enter. And she might have gotten impregnated by somebody. She had this child. She has all these responsibilities now. And finally, her dreams all shatters and she commits suicide. Now, this is a perspective. What could have happened in the life of Judith Shakespeare? So, even if Shakespeare had a sister with excellent talents like him, she couldn't become Shakespeare reach his level because she had to face all these limitations, disencouragement. So our narrator is pointing out the harsh conditions, the discouragement that is faced by female writers even during the golden era of English literature. And maybe we do not know one or two female writers might have written something but even that would have been anonymous. They wouldn't have revealed their names. Now, what about the women after the Elizabethan age? She says there might have been aristocratic, educated women who wrote works. These women might have been talented. They might have the education, the money. But the problem would have been that they wrote, but the people, the literary world of men might not have supported them. They might have called these women crazy for uh, aspiring to be a writer. And slowly, we have somebody named Afra Ben coming into the picture. Now, she is the one who laid the path for the coming female writers. Afra Ben, she had excellent writing skills. Now, along with that, when her husband died, she was forced to earn her own living. So, she had no other way. She had to earn somehow. So, she used her creative skills to earn. So she showed the way, she paved the way, she showed the women that you can use writing in order to earn money. And by the time it was 19th century, you can see more women coming into writing. Like George Eliot, Bronte sisters, Jane Austen, they all started to write. But again our narrator notes that even though they were writing, they were writing novels. We have very less poetry from women, but we have enough novels. And the reason for this is because when you write poetry, poetry requires a lot of concentration. You need your own space, your own privacy. And what these women lacked is this. 
these women were all from middle class and so they had very less privacy you remember a room of one son they did not have that space to sit and think about the poem that they are going to write to dive into their themes so they couldn't write poetry they only wrote novels and in chapter 5 she talks about the recent writers recent women writers of her period She goes through the books and she finds a debut novel about the friendship between two women named Chloe and Olivia. Now this was very refreshing for our narrator because she says that till now whatever books we had about women it were all written by men and it would be all about women's relationship with another man about a woman being a mother a woman being a wife but relationships between women like friendships this was very refreshing. and she says that there are countless stories about women like this that has not been ever told in books because we are always trying to see women from the perspective of a man we have never seen women from the perspective of a woman so a lot of stories from those perspectives are still to be told and for that again she stresses what does a woman need a woman need money and room privacy of her own so that she can write on this and in chapter 6 the last chapter our narrator is saying that a man and a woman are both simultaneously at the same time they are entering a taxi and she is very happy to see this because this reminds her of a unity she says that this unity should be there in literature also that is we are not asking that men's experiences should be taken away from literature we are only saying just like how the man and the women are in the same car men's experiences and women's experiences a man's mind and a woman's mind both of it should be there in literature and she says coleridge has rightly said a great mind is androgynous that is undivided attention between both sex and as an example she points out shakespeare so literature should show both the male's mind and the woman's mind and only then it becomes complete and if literature should show the actual mind of a woman then who should write the women should start writing and then she addresses the women the students of the college who are sitting in front of her listening to her speech lecture and she tells them that you are the ones who are supposed to write you are educated you have the opportunities you are the ones who are supposed to write you should create a legacy for women it's only then that we can incorporate both male and female perspectives and form this literary tradition so what will happen our judith shakespeare who did not get the chance who had to leave her dreams because she was a woman she would be reborn through each one of us so virginia woolf is telling these students that this this group of women the women in her audience they have the chance to create history that judith shakespeare never had that chance is there with them and with this she ends her lecture so basically through this essay virginia woolf is asking women to write she is inspiring women to write so that your perspectives women's perspectives would be there in the literary tradition only then literary tradition will become complete both man's point of view and women's point of view should be there in literature to make it complete so she talks about various hardships that women faced throughout history and according to her there are two most important things that a woman requires to become creative and that is financial independence and a space of her own she calls it a room of her own so with that we will wind up this video i hope you have understood thank you for watching